Hello everyone and welcome to the BFI Film Academy January Lab. Uh, my name is Alex and I'm the Film Academy Festival and Events Producer. Our uh, panel discussion today will explore the changes that the global pandemic has brought to the world of film festivals, um, what to expect from your festival experiences in 2021, and also how to best adjust your festival strategies for these changing times. Um, we have our Film Academy um, team working behind the scenes um, today. No, once again, um, is managing the a chat box. So if you have any questions for us, for the BFI, about um, BFI, about our Film Academy, our lab series, then please feel free uh, to put your questions in the chat and just introduce yourselves um, in the chat. Um, and um, for those of you who don't know, we have our short film festival, Future Film Festival, coming up in February. 18th until the 21st of um, February um, and uh, we'll be um, launching the full program on the 29th of January so if you follow us on um, our social um, channels if you sign up for the Film Academy newsletter you'll be able to find out uh, more once the program launches however if you do have any questions about the festival today then once again please feel free to ask uh, no in uh, the chat box and he'll um, try to answer all those questions. Uh, my colleague Laura is managing the Q&A box today. So for any questions that you have for our panelists today or for our host, then please put them in the uh, Q&A box on the bottom of your screens. And we'll um, devote the last 15 minutes um, of um, today's session to your questions and we'll try to get through as many of them um, as we can. Um, we have our competition partner Lacey with us again today who will be um, giving away a hard drive at the end of this session. And as always, we'll be awarding the best question asked. Um, so get your thinking hats on and just make sure that you please put uh, your full names when you are asking questions in the Q&A box. This is really, really important so that we know who uh, the final prize is um, going to. Um, and uh, for all of you who entered the Lacey competition when you are signing up um, for this event on Eventbrite, please do stick around until the very end of this session, so after the um, audience um, Q&A, uh, and we'll be revealing the winner um, live on Zoom. Um, so um, if you're not around to claim your prize, we'll move on to calling a different na name, so do, do stick around. Um, our session today is hosted by Anna Bogutskaya. Anna is the co-founder of the horror film collective The Final Girls, and she's also the festival director of Underwire um, Festival. Uh, but before I hand over to Anna, I just wanted to let you know that our session today is being recorded, and the recording will be uh, uploaded to the BFI YouTube channel um, later on um, next week. Um, so if you've missed anything today, or if you just want to uh, watch the session again, you will be able to. And now um, I'll hand over to Anna to introduce our lovely panelists to you. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Alex. And hi, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Bogutska, and Alex mentioned I run the Underwire Festival. And I'm very excited to be hosting today's session, which is all going to be about film festivals, how it's been from their point of view adapting to this new reality with the pandemic and how and kind of any lessons or tips that we can get for you guys for young filmmakers about how to adapt to this new situation and get the most out of film festivals so it the pandemic obviously has caused a massive disruption to the entire industry and to film festivals all around the world and a lot of them have adapted really quickly and effectively to this new situation have managed to connect with new audiences and brought new viewers together emotionally if not physically um, to watch films and to connect with each other over filmmaking as well so we'll be diving throughout the next hour into the many many questions that rise from this now not so new situation both for festivals and for filmmakers alike I'll be asking our panelists questions for the first hour and then make sure to keep your questions coming into the chat box and I'll try to get through as many as possible in the last part of the session. So let me introduce our fantastic expert panelists first. We've got Katie McCullough, who's the founder of Festival Formula, got Senya Sankovic, who's the festival manager, and also Sonia Jankiv, who is the manager of film programs at Four River Film Festival. We've got Philip Ilson, who's the director, who's the artistic director of the London Short Film Festival, and also the senior short film advisor for the BFI London Film Festival. And last but not least uh, we've got Rebecca McShafey from the children and young the children and young people's coordinator at Glasgow Youth Film Festival um, welcome all of you thank you so much for giving up a little bit of your time on this uh, crispy Saturday afternoon to um, to talk about film festivals with us 
So, I, so to kick off first, I'd like to start with Phil, if I may, because London Short Film Festival is kicking off next week. And I wanted to ask you, um, what was the most challenging part of gearing up for a physical festival as you usually would, and then realizing you needed to adapt and deliver a hybrid or maybe a fully online edition? Um, well, we were obviously quite lucky because um, the, first, the, the pandemic hit in March. Um, so um, there was a lot of talk about how, you know, how long it's going to last. Um, mm -hmm. And just looking at what other venues were doing. I mean, we, we noticed that places like the Festival Hall and music venues, the Barbican had pretty much announced that they wouldn't be open until March 2021. So regardless of, um, of what we knew then, we kind of knew that I think that this was going to go on for a year. So right at the start, we planned to do uh, an online edition. Um, we were also in a strange position in March that we were changing um, my festival director, Sarah Chorley, was leaving and the new person, Amanda Parker, was coming on. Um, so that sort of changeover also meant that we could sort of discuss how to take things forward in a new way. So, yeah, in March, the decision was made to be 100% online. So it was then finding the right people to bring in to how to deliver that. And we're working with an amazing um, festival producer this, this year called Akina uh, Aquino, who's come on board and has been had experience with moving festivals online. In terms of the venue stuff, there was always this kind of, you know, discussion about, well, let's keep, keep the options open because, you know, maybe cinemas will be open in January. So rather than being a physical festival that has some online stuff. The plan was to be a fully online festival that has some physical stuff. So we did plan a few screenings at the BFI South Bank, at the Rio in Dalston, the Curzon Soho. Of course, those aren't happening now, but it wasn't a problem because um, all those screenings will be online anyway. And also the, the few screenings that we did have planned, the venues are very happy to reschedule, you know, for when they reopen. So those screenings will go ahead at a later date, but just not during the festival dates. So yeah, we, we'd always plan to be a fully 100% online festival right from the start. Awesome. And um, Senya and Sanya, if I can bring you in for your experiences, because um, Four River happened in September 2020, just a few months ago. Um, so what were some of the most notable changes that you noticed from delivering an, an online edition of the festival? Uh, hello, everybody. Um, very nice to see you and to be part of this panel, of course. Uh, well, I can start in Xenia and I will just um, switch at one point. Um, for us, um, well, it was um, in September, the situation in Croatia was uh, rather okay with numbers and everything. So actually during the summer, we planned to be uh, semi-online and uh, physical uh, at one point. Uh, however, our government uh, just a couple of days before the festival had to start uh, made a decision that uh, uh, students from schools cannot uh, go from schools anywhere, so they couldn't attend uh, our um, screenings. So basically we had a situation that we had to, uh, in just a few days, uh, switch everything online except the evening screenings because um, as we are called for river film festival we have this uh, amazing uh, open air cinema on uh, four rivers uh, in karlovac and in our hometown and uh, this is something what we managed to um, hold this year and uh, so we had these uh, open air cinemas and open air screenings uh, held in uh, what's in in our county and um, the the reach from uh, from and the audience was amazing because um, you could see that everybody was eager to come and uh, not only from the small cities in county that were uh, hosting the the cinemas but also uh, from uh, kids who attended the festival normally but they couldn't so uh, they would just come to these open air uh, screenings 
um and for the for the online part uh, we really had we were amazed with numbers um because uh, we we had really a huge um huge audience and huge numbers of people who uh, participated in the festival and uh, this just uh, is uh, making us uh, for this year uh, for sure we we will have to do it somehow online and physical again yeah and um, if i may continue oh good hello to everyone uh, so basically we were in the first week of school, uh, so that uh, usually um, professors come and go to, to the screenings in person with kids, but uh, I think in this silly situation where they were kind of locked in the school, but uh, coming uh, to school, they were really happy to uh, have some kind of uh, uh, another part of a program that they could uh, watch in the classroom and uh, yes Sanya said uh, we did keep this kind of offline uh, program uh, with the evening screenings uh, in four cities around uh, our city so that was uh, um, it was important because they were uh, all of, of these screenings were attended uh, by the directors of uh, the features so we got more publicity through that also so it was really it was nice. Uh, they they were happy to come to a screening <laughs> as well because they didn't have much live screenings uh, throughout the year. Thank you so much for um, so much detail about how it's been for you. And um, Rebecca, if I can pass over to you now, um, the Glasgow Youth Film Festival. One of the things that makes it really unique is the fact that it's co-curated with young with young programmers as well, with young people. Um, and can you talk a little bit about how that process, the collaborative process of that, changed with the new situation? Um, yeah, of course, because it changed completely. <laughs> um, and I think the first thing that we all had to do was let go completely of any prior expectations for the festival which was very difficult to do because each year we invite young people to come in and to kind of essentially take over the cinema for um, four days and they run all their own events and their screenings and they work very closely with the Glasgow Film Curation team and marketing team to design all those aspects. Usually um, it takes about six months to design, recruit, deliver GYFF. It's quite a long process. We do a full summer school of two weeks. We go to Edinburgh Film Festival. We do all these really fun things. And unfortunately, I found myself this summer on furlough. The cinema was fully closed. Um, but there was like a little bright patch in Glasgow in like August, September, pushing into October where the cinema was actually open and there was very strict social distancing guidelines. Mm. So I was brought back um, from furlough seven weeks out of what would be traditionally our GYFF weekend and told like, you know, we really want to do this by the senior exec team and like, how can we make it happen? So we had to think really quickly and really creatively about how we could still produce something, but also make it meaningful for the young people that we work with and invite into the space. Um, because time was so limited, we made the decision not to recruit a new cohort, even though we had already kind of established a, a kind of regular recruitment process. We had new recruits waiting to come in and hear if they would be um, available. But for our team, we just felt that because it was going to be so experimental, we were going to work with our youth board, who we work with more regularly year round, and to invite any past recruits onto this year, which we are a bit more prepared for. Um, a couple of the things that we learned is we ran mostly physical events because the cinema was opened and because GFT was still developing its online capacity for Glasgow Film at Home, which is now available and will change our approach for next year's festival. Um, so we did four screenings and we did lots of additional content, pre-recorded Q&As, um, and it went really well, but I suppose again it kind of came back to having to rethink what success looked like um, usually for that weekend we get about 1500 plus young people through the doors it's super busy it's really fun and it's exciting and this year we were celebrating a sold out screening of 50 people 
So um, I think that's something that will probably continue even if we are running physical and online events together is to kind of re think what does success for a physical event now look like and that's something I think that we will be thinking about um, over the next year as people kind of grapple with the effects of all this. Thank you so much and Katie um, to hand over to you now for a bit because you're working across the entire gamut of film festivals and working really closely with filmmakers as well and helping them get the most out of film festivals too. What have been some of the most interesting trends or changes that you've noticed from across the film festival landscape adapting to the pandemic? Yeah, um, we've seen a lot um, and I think um, they're mostly positive. Um, that's the main thing. So um, I the one thing I would say is that the actual kind of um, the opportunities to have Q and A's and and be part of panel discussions at festivals has increased tenfold because pre pandemic, if your screening has happening, you know, the other side of the world in Australia or America or Canada, unless you were physically there, you wouldn't have the opportunity to talk about your film. So what we've actually seen is a lot of film festivals embracing, look, we're going online. So let's, able you know we're able to kind of bring in all of our filmmakers and have lengthy discussions with them so that's one benefit we've seen is actually kind of having the opportunity to still engage with a festival still engage with an audience and still be able to be involved even though we're in a kind of very pandemic riddled slash you know electronic world and I, we know from a lot of festivals they are still wanting to carry that on even when we can get back to physical screenings because it's so beneficial for the filmmaker, but also the audience that they can actually get to see the filmmaker talk about their film. So that's one thing that we've always been saying to filmmakers, the way that we've kind of been saying to our clients is look at it as if you couldn't attend your screening and there wasn't a pandemic going on. You wouldn't have that opportunity. Now you do. The other, um, the other trend that we have seen, again, kind of you know, posit a positive spin on it, is festivals that maybe didn't have an industry section or a networking opportunity. So these were festivals that it was purely about the screening, it was about having an audience and that was it, are now kind of in a position of saying, well, we want to be able to deliver something to our filmmakers so they feel engaged, they feel looked after. So a lot of festivals are actually introducing, look, hey, we've got a special guest to talk for 40 minutes that you can sign up for because you're a selected filmmaker or we're doing a networking opportunity, you know, we're going to put you in groups of, you know, small teams and then actually kind of like, you know, every 10 minutes swap you around. And that's something really important. I have already seen in the Q&A that there's lots of questions about networking opportunities. Um, they, they still exist. They're very different to what they normally would feel like. But if anything, I would say it's more beneficial and more fruitful because mm naturally networking is in a loud venue with drinks in hand you're trying to snatch people for five ten minutes whereas actually with a lot of these kind of um you know more tailored networking opportunities you are able to really properly talk to somebody and you know have conversations that carry on after that kind of meeting so we've definitely seen a lot of trends that are positive mm. again it's going to vary with the festival because you know there are thousands of festivals across the world all very different focuses and remits but also very different sizes um, and what we have found is the smaller regional festivals have actually kind of upped their game because they they're more nimble they can kind of make those different decisions they don't necessarily have boards or you know kind of sponsors to have to kind of talk over and talk around but then also some of the bigger festivals have slightly muted um some of their opportunities because they're a bigger ship so they they can't kind of make as many quick decisions so mostly positive um in a very dire situation so there is kind of a lot to still get back from the festival circuit thank you and um I, i'd like to ask a question to everyone really because you've all had very different experiences and picking up on something really interesting that rebecca mentioned of kind of redefining how you measure a successful event or a successful festival. So what, what does it look like now for you to, um, to deliver a successful festival event? 
I mean, we haven't had our festival yet, so we don't know. <laughs> I know, know, but, but you have had but LFF. I would, but I would, but I do have LFF, that's true. And that yeah. was interesting because, I mean, something that Katie just mentioned about every festival doing things differently, you know, obviously every festival's made a decision as to how they're going to go online. Mm. Um, and specifically with the short film program at LFF, which, um, you know, I'm one of the programmers for, you know, the BFI Festivals Office decided that, uh, the short films were going to be available for free to watch on the BFI player for the for the duration of the festival, um, which meant I think the audiences for the shorts was something like eighty thousand um, across the UK. Compared um, to how many you sh in previous times? Well, it would however many people you can fit in NFT screen one. You know, like a couple of hundred maybe. You know, across the festival in two or three screenings. Um, whether you're in agreement with how short films are being presented in that way, that's a, that's a different sort of question. I mean, we're very much curating the programmes for London Short Film Festival and only having them available for watch for 48 hours. And, um, you know, and, and obviously there's a, a fee attached to buying a, a ticket to watch that programme. Um, but other festivals are doing it in different ways. But yeah, certainly with LFF, the experience there was that the audience went up a thousand fold, you know, many thousands fold. Um, don't quote me. Actually, I know we're on online here, but I don't <laughs> actually know exactly the figure of short films, but I'm pretty sure it was something around that much for the LFF. It was pretty, it was pretty large. It's crazy. Yeah. So that was obviously positive. If I may. Uh, so uh, running this festival for about 15 years, we were always kind of concentrating on the live event. <laughs> I mean, we were kind of never um, putting some uh, extra, uh, for example, screenings online available and things like that. So we had complete mindset change uh, of running it. And uh, we were kind of monitoring the uh, numbers of uh, like audience reach and everything. and. Uh, those numbers are a lot, lot bigger than, uh, of course, when you can, as Philip said, uh, seat 150 people in a screening venue. So we're happy because of that and um, we'll definitely continue doing this uh, now that we, <laughs> we've been through it. Yeah, I think um, for us at Glasgow Film Theatre, we have a really deep outreach policy that's really kind of um, got great community links and has existed for kind of 20 plus years. We work for a lot of schools with a lot of um, charitable organisations in the area and I think that for me part of the success is yes it's when we go online is about audience engagement but it's also about the depth of our engagement as well. Um, it's to make sure that we still make sure that the young people who are participating in our programs or getting a good quality experience from us um, and not missing out as Katie was saying like for a lot of our young people who come on our programs like GYFF for young selectors by the end of it they're usually all friends and they all go out and they go and see each other's work and shows and they, they become this kind of supportive network and it's how do we still um, keep that ethos even though we're delivering online um we're doing our best but we've still to kind of I suppose kind of do the evaluation process on it mm -hmm. um it is much trickier than when you are in person and able to make those connections um but i think it's about trying to be creative and also to keep sessions fun um i think we kind of keep forgetting sometimes like you know that we have to create space in these webinars and things for for fun um <laughs> and yet how do we make sure that we don't lose that as we go online mm. i would agree with rebecca uh, here um, because uh, a very important part of each festival is this connecting uh, after the screenings but um, i think that um, unfortunately you can't do it online i mean you can but it's not the same it's uh, completely something different and um, the funny thing was when we were um, we were about to start uh, for river and a couple of um, authors that were um, that were coming uh, here for quite um, quite a lot of years 
have also participated in one of our educational programs which happened before and they end up in uh, self-isolation because they were contacts with somebody who was uh, uh, COVID positive and um, they were like okay now we are two weeks uh, at home we have to be in isolation but then we can come to four river i mean, I mean it's it's okay because we will be out <laughs> and um, i think that um, everybody now is uh, after a year of this um, online uh, stuff and everything is um, really eager and awaiting uh, when when we will finally have a chance to meet in person and to hug each other mm -hmm. and just to have this physical contact because i think that this is something what's really missing i you can i mean the the numbers are amazing and uh, for sure it's something uh complete to a different uh, different thing and we have learned everybody has have learned uh, from it and uh, we have to uh, i think um, keep something online so it can be uh, reachable to everybody but um, i think that um, the benefit from uh, from this year i really hope so it will be that we will have and the festival physically and we will have we will have it in person hmm. now, I, that's such an interesting point i'd like to stay on it for a little bit because it it has come up and i think this is one of the things that um is both an opportunity but there's a lot of work to be done around it to do it properly and um i'd love to maybe start with katie because you mentioned just how many different festivals you've seen experiment and engage with different ways of of not just growing audiences but giving filmmakers and audiences a really good experience that depth of engagement that rebecca was mentioning about so what are some of the best ways that you've seen film festivals try to recreate that networking or connection opportunity both for audiences and for the filmmakers who are participating um yeah i mean the, like i say it's gonna there's so many different variants because of you know how much the festival has to spend of budget what their intended audience is and everything else i think there are a few examples that have made me go that's a really good opportunity um so the first one would be a dead center film festival in Ohio, um, they they experimented by having a green room, which was a Zoom room, but it was open 24 hours at any given point. Huh. Now, but yeah, like, so for us, we were like, that's brilliant, because our clients are dotted all over the world. So we're straddling time zones. Mm -hmm. It meant that anyone could be in that Zoom, that Zoom room, that Zoom green room at any point, it could be uh, somebody from the industry, it could be someone from the festival, it could be another filmmaker, but you got to actually experience um, that kind of, you know, um, chance encounter, perhaps, you know, that you would get at a natural festival. Um, I thought that was a really good um, way of playing around with the circumstances that we're in. Um, the other thing that we have seen, and again, depending on the festival, is Ho ho um, hosting a live stream so the way to kind of like put that into a you know an everyday circumstance is like you have to turn up at the cinema at a certain time to see the film so having a live stream online meant that you have a collective audience albeit not in the same room but in the same space that you can engage with that film and therefore you have a lot of the chat function kind of being open, especially if they're hosting a QA and a in the same space after, because it means that everyone who's asking those questions has literally just watched the film together, which that's a slight argument to be had about, well, there's a benefit between pre-recorded because there's no technical glitches, but at the same time, you don't get any natural response from an audience to a live, which is where, you know, you can kind of have that spur of the moment questions and, you know off the cuff remarks um those have been two kind of really good um opportunities for filmmakers but also for an audience to really kind of um engage with a film um i think as well some festivals have taken the plunge with experimenting with how they kind of share their content so if you look at um ann arbor in michigan which is it's like really been running for like 55 years i think so it's an academy affiliated festival but it's its focus is experimental um so therefore something very niche something that's not necessarily everyone's taste but they are very unique in that they 
um, they they curate content that isn't necessarily pure experimental it's a narrative told in an experimental manner so it's a little bit more accessible um, they were one of the first festivals that had to go online like they were kind of cancelled mm. literally kind of like in the run-up they did something unique in that they put everything uh everything was free to view it was still kind of behind you know you still had to register to get a ticket um but they also live streamed a lot of their content um and what they found really beneficial for them as a film festival is that they could present their work to the world and actually introduce experimental film to people that maybe had never experienced it before so for them it was a gamble but they were like look we want to respect the filmmakers whose work has been curated we want to be able to kind of still show to our audience who would turn up but also they increased um, their viewership largely, like a few people have mentioned already. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of ended up having 64,000 streams of the work that they kind of like, you know, showed. And they were a festival that maybe received footfall wise, probably about like 10,000. So there was a massive kind of, it was a gamble, but it paid off because it meant that now this year they, they kind of you know they know what they were capable of last time and they can actually kind of tailor it so again like it's going to be different for every festival but there have been some really unique ways of kind of showing work and hitting a new audience but still thinking of the filmmaker I th think the one thing I do want to stress to anyone is these festivals are doing everything in their power to make sure that the filmmakers feel comfortable, that they feel respected, and that their work is still curated to a high degree. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's lots of different types of festivals that maybe don't do that as well, but the majority of decent, good, legitimate festivals are always thinking of, first of all, the filmmakers, and then the audience as well. Thank you so much. That's, that's a very important note. And um, can, I wanted to ask as well, Senya and Sanya, because Four Rivers has a lot of um, mentorship program, mem mentorship events and um, workshops, very, you know, specific um, design, kind of more industry focused or not so much industry, but very filmmaker focused events. Um, so how did you manage those to and, and think about them to try to make sure that the people attending and the young filmmakers attending were getting as much as possible from them? Well, basically, there was a time constraint uh, uh, because when people are in uh, Carlos for five days, then uh, it's much easier to handle uh, workshops and everything. But since uh, the lecturers and uh, uh, mentors, uh, they were uh, like distanced, um, it it was uh, we did have an engagement, and uh, a few of the workshops were running. Uh, but uh, we kind of restricted them in time because um, I mean we still wanted to keep them but the focus was on the, the screenings and uh, on the like engagement of the uh, uh, of the students who are making the films so basically um, it showed that since it was the beginning of the school year and everyone were excited about uh, like going to school, going to college uh, for a couple of days and everything, uh, we had slightly less um, um, uh, submissions to engage in the online uh, workshops. Uh, the ones that were uh, held, uh, they were successful. Uh, they, I mean, they uh, we got we got good feedback. But just in the matter of um, like curating them, it was time constrained uh, and uh, slightly less submissions. But in the end, I mean, uh, it, it's also better to have five people who are more interested in a masterclass or workshop uh, on one topic than uh, 20 of them online who are just like clicking on the <laughs> different tabs and everything. So uh, yeah, it had pros and cons. Thank you. And um, Rebecca, if I can kind of um, hand over it to you, um, thinking about still what you mentioned about the depth of engagement, I wanted to ask kind of not so much about audiences, um, but rather with your partners, specifically schools, film schools or local partners. You mentioned a lot about how you work with GFT. So how how has that experience been adapting into into a new format with its many pros and cons of working with people to try to uh, build something that 
has never really had a model for it before so kind of building something completely new yeah um that's a great question because that's something that we're really grappling with now um i think when gyff happens in September, it was a bit similar to what Christine was saying in that schools were just going back and they were grappling with what their new world looked like. So it didn't feel like the right time. However, I feel like now schools' confidence um, and colleges that we work with confidence is growing um, with engaging online. We are now preparing for that. So we um, each year we work quite regularly with um, our local colleges. We do a project with um, some of the college students. Um, and also we work with them um, on our short film prize um, specifically, or it's not a prize yet, but last year it was our short film um, screenings that we had. Um, what I would say is that there's ironically maybe more scope to do things now that schools are fully not in the classroom and are online. Um, it's actually slightly easier to design workshops knowing that schools are going to be online and college students are going to be online um, rather than I think before with the hybrid model or with them being fully in the classroom it was you know we would just usually do a lot of in-person delivery and that was proving really challenging moving online um, so we're really excited to see how that will work with the thought in September that we will have a kind of offer um, usually we do a lot of careers activities or like careers day um, so we'll be looking to move those aspects online and I think it's important for me the most important thing about that is to start that engagement work now so that we're built revisiting our relationships with schools and colleges with the young filmmakers that usually submit to us that we are providing opportunities for them to kind of come and engage so that when we get to the festival they're, they're comfortable with what work we're doing with what we're offering and they're maybe more willing to sign up for a longer period of time or multiple sessions or sessions out with their class time as well so that's the approach that we're taking again it's all a bit of an experiment um but i would hope that it wouldn't necessarily affect young people still submitting their films to us because actually we might, as Katie was saying, have the ability to show now that we, I don't think we'll ever fully lose any of the lessons from this year about having online content available. So actually we might have more capacity to show films than we would have done previously um, where we were limited by the cinema capacity and the kind of slots that we had. Mm -hmm. That might not necessarily be as big a you know restriction in the future so a lot of positives but still a lot to kind of work through and experiment with mm. thank you and that's an excellent point to bring in a question that uh i'm sure some filmmakers have been thinking about and whether there's a reticence to submit or screen their films at online or hybrid film festivals. Um, and do you think that it makes a difference in the, do you think it makes a difference in a short film's life cycle? And it's something I'd love everyone to contribute on, but Phil, if we can start with you. Um, yeah, I think everyone will have different things to say about this. I mean, in terms of submissions, we still got, 5,000 submissions for London Short Film Festival, mainly because we'd opened in February. So mm -hmm. a lot of the submissions we were getting were films that had already been made before the pandemic. Obviously, a bit later on, we got a lot more sort of lockdown films sent in. Uh, I think next year might be a bit of an issue over how many films we get sent, because obviously this year, not so many films are being made, but we won't know that until we open again in, in February. Um, but that's not, re sorry, what was the question again? That wasn't really <laughs> relevant. <laughs> No, I'm actually interested in kind of um, perhaps it's whether filmmakers have shown any resistance to having their films screened in a new format yeah. film festival and if you think it actually affects a short film's life. I mean, it's, it, it's a, yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Um, obviously, people are waiting to get back into the cinema. Um, because they want to be seeing their films on the big screen. And I know we've talked about much bigger audiences online, but you know, there's no, no denying that being there in an audience in a cinema is still something that people really want. I don't think people are holding off just at the moment. I mean, Katie will probably know more about this. In terms of you know, presenting the films, one of the things I was very keen to do right at the start was to not have the films geo-blocked because 
I believe, just talking to filmmakers, they just want their films to be seen as much as possible. Um, obviously, at the stage where we were deciding whether to geoblock or not, we had to ask the filmmakers whether they wanted their films geoblocked to the UK only. And uh, the response was pretty strong. Out of 220 films, I think 12 have geoblocked. So all the others are available to watch internationally. Mm -hmm. And for uh, next year, because we are planning to still have an online presence for 2022, I think one of the questions in one of the points in the um, in the submissions will be that the films won't be geoblocked. Um, I just think it's important for the filmmakers, if they've got this opportunity to be seen as wide as possible, then why would you want to limit that? Because I'm not a big fan of the whole festival premiere thing, the whole festival sort of strategy uh, thing. It's like people just want to see their films get out there and to be seen. So that's, that's, does that answer the question? It kind of does, and um, okay. I'd love for you to weigh in. Uh yeah, um, I've I've seen a few questions about uh, Q and A uh, in the Q and A section about Premiere. Um, I think the the thing about um, the situation we're in now is to try and unpack it and kind of try and um, compare and contrast to if we were not in a pandemic situation. So obviously, if we were not in a pandemic situation, a lot of these festivals will still have Premiere stipulations. Um, they would be screened, you know, physically, so therefore you wouldn't have to worry about geo-blocking and so on. Um, I think it's down to the individual filmmaker what they want to take from the festival. The thing that I always say to filmmakers, and I've been doing this 16 years now, so I've seen lots of different changes, Premier stipulation is not something to get so focused and precious about as a short filmmaker, unless you are aiming for the very top tier festivals like Venice, Locarno, Cannes, Berlinale, and so on, where they require what we call an absolute premiere, international, European, world. You do not need to worry about your premier stipulation. The only time that you need to con consider it is if a festival requires it. And I can tell you now, the majority of them are regional. So Tribeca needs a New York premiere. You could have played at Austin, you could have played at London Film Festival in Glasgow, you're still eligible to submit to Tribeca. Um, Edinburgh International for a UK film requires a Scottish premiere. So you could play everywhere else as long as you haven't played in Scotland. So I think people have to kind of try and reconfigure how they approach the circuit because gone are the days where you were kind of dictated as to where you could submit first. Like if we went back 10 years ago in the UK, every festival had a premier stipulation of some degree. Whereas now we have probably like two and one of them, one of them is doc specific for Sheffield Doc Fest. So it's not about choosing where's my world premiere. You don't have that facility as a filmmaker because you have to put your film in consideration alongside everyone else. So the way that I keep saying it is 10 years ago, you could get festival selections really easy and the awards were the hard part. Now, because so many submissions are being made, so many more filmmakers are putting content onto the circuit to be considered, getting the selection is hard, winning the awards a bonus. So you kind of, you're, you're, the way to approach it is you want your film to be seen and you want it to be seen by as many audiences as, as you can because you want to prove that your work works. It stands on its own two feet. So I would say in terms of uh, going onto the circuit, people have been hesitant at the beginning because they were like, I don't want my film to be seen online. Mm -hmm. The term online had a derogatory kind of negative aspect to it because it was presumed, oh, well, my film's going to be put on Vimeo or YouTube for the whole world to see, um, which that's a whole other conversation. Some film festivals don't mind a film being online. The majority still do. Um, so I think it's trying to unpack and un unlearn some preconceived notions uh, that online doesn't necessarily mean free for all. I will say there are some festivals that have done it and a few festivals I've been surprised that have done it. Um, bearing in mind they have contradictory rules and regulations, but um, it's to actually kind of embrace the fact that if you hold off your film until we are all in cinemas again, mm -hmm. you don't know when that's going to be. Mm -hmm. You also can only go by what you know in your area. 
So for example, take America, state by state, it's different. So you've got to think about where you're based and where your festival that you're submitting to is based. So we've always said to people, don't hold off submitting because you prolong your circuit journey um, and you're just sitting on your film waiting for something to happen. Um, the whole point is to get an audience, which also, and I'm sorry, I'm waffling now, but um, I think the thing that I get very, very frustrated about with filmmakers is um, this, this need to kind of be with their film at every single step of the way. The thing that happens once you've finished your film is that it's not just yours, you've made that film to be seen and you're not going to be able to be physically present for every single time your film gets selected and screened. It could be the other side of the world. It could be on a day that you just cannot attend, but it will still screen, it'll still go ahead. It still does its purpose, which is reaching an audience. So the way that we've kind of been prepping our clients is pre-pandemic, you might not be able to attend, but it still happens and it still works. But that's still a selection you can talk about, that you can shout about on socials. It's still an opportunity for you to have career conversations. Mm -hmm. So even though these screenings are happening in a way that maybe you're not very keen on, that still doesn't stop you from knocking on an agent's door or, you know, or, um, you know, an employer's door going, oh, by the way, I've, I've just had my film screened at this festival. You know, that, that's still something you can utilize. Um, so it's trying to kind of get people to realize premieres aren't necessarily kind of the be all and end all. And I can tell you now, and I say this to everyone, because I think it's really important. Every client we've had in the 16 years I've been doing this, that has been shortlisted and longlisted for BAFTAs, BIFFAs and Oscars have never had a very big world premiere. It's always been their fifth, sixth, 12th, 15th screening that qualifies them. And I think that's important because get away from the prestige, move towards getting your film seen. That's what I would say. And um, I was being a little bit provocative there. I obviously <laughs> um, don't want to, um, obviously the work, that, I mean, that's the thing, the work that Katie does is amazing on really advising filmmakers because that's the thing, every festival is different and there's no rules to how to run a film festival. Mm. You know, you can just start your own festival tomorrow and do it the way that you want to do it. That's, you know, no one, there's no guidebook, but, um, you know, knowing, what each festival you know what their 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 the way they work i think that's really uh, valuable that filmmakers need to know that you know um, and the what you know the, what katie does is is obviously incredible in terms of that work so yeah you do need a festival strategy um, <laughs> But it, I'm a bit dismissive. You're a really good point, and I love um, to hear um, all of your advice on it because it's specifically thinking of the filmmakers, so the aspiring filmmakers in the audience. With this expanded audience that you've all mentioned, that you've seen um, either in other festivals or in your own or festivals that you collaborate with, um, what are the best? What are the best tips for filmmakers who are having their work seen? through by many, many more people than perhaps um, they would have if it was just a, a regular physical festival. What can they do to take advantage of that expanded audience? This is for everyone. So whoever wants to start, maybe, maybe Rebecca, if we can start with you. Well, I was going to say, I maybe don't necessarily have the best advice for this because we are about um, kind of opening up spaces for young people to show their films. And that's kind of how I see our role in it is like kind of, um, yeah, being a space maker. Um, I would say that in my experience working with the young people that I have is that, um, and the young filmmakers that have come and shown their films is that, there is sometimes a bit of fear about showing or submitting their work um, and sometimes I think that you know them being like this isn't my best work it's not my masterpiece so I don't want to I'm not ready to put it out yet and sometimes it's just having that kind of enc more encouraging conversation of saying you know you you should be putting it out um, and you know as kind of Katie was saying that kind of sometimes Sometimes holding on to making your biggest debut can actually hold you back. Um, the other thing I would suggest is um, look at, you know, at Glasgow Film, we've got the opportunities of GYFF and our young selectors 
which is our Glasgow Film Festival programme, Edinburgh, BFI, lots of festivals have similar programmes where they're maybe inviting young people to participate in the curation process. Um, and I would say that's really valuable if you are a filmmaker because getting that kind of behind the scenes view of how um, festival curators watch films, the kind of discussions that they're having, the kind of things that, um, you know, kind of make a film what, um, the success in a festival um, can be really useful. And that's been generally the feedback that we've got from our young people was that it's made them think differently about how they, would, how they might submit or how often they might submit because they've had now this understanding of what the festival looks like from the other side. And there's maybe for young people, particularly if you know you're 18 to 22, 25, like a demystifying, um, learning that everybody in this, um, you know, uh, industry is human and we're not all like oh darling that was terrible you know that actually we enjoy a wide variety of films and I think that there's something really comforting in in doing that and kind of seeing a festival from that different side so that would probably be the best advice I would have on it. <laughs> um, Senya Sanya, would you like to contribute? Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, yeah. There are several segments for youth filmmakers to consider. Of course, when you submit uh, the film, um, for example, our festival is in the Youth Cinema Network, and uh, we tend to share uh, some of the films among the network, and we have more than 40 festivals in the network currently. So uh, if your film is good, and uh, for example, especially if you get an award, then it gets to be nominated for some other festivals and so on. I mean, that is in the regulations of our festival, but it's kind of gives you more and more opportunity. And um, of course, it's good if you, as a filmmaker, have, for example, a, I don't know, Facebook page of the film, and then if you promote, oh, I've been to this festival, I've been to this festival, and things like that. But um, I think that um, a lot of young people uh, should volunteer at the film festival also. Just not being, uh, I mean, they, uh, the film, the people who kind of grew up in a school uh, that had uh, some kind of a school group or things like that. I mean, Sanya and I are part of <laughs> part of that kind of groups for the whole life. But uh, if you, as a filmmaker, are interested in film, start volunteering at as many festivals that you can as well. Not only promoting. Uh, the work, your film, but yourself as a filmmaker, as a volunteer, and I mean, opportunities that will open are numerous. And also just to add and um, to somehow connect with what Katie mentioned was that um, I think that uh, young uh, authors should definitely try to produce more. And uh, as you mentioned, not to stick to something uh, like their precious uh, film, which, uh, which then uh, they get, tend to get really disappointed if it doesn't uh, enter the competition program or something like that. But um, they, I think that they have to be um, aware that uh, you have some selection committee and a jury in the end if uh, if a festival if it reaches the festival and um, these are also um, those are people who have their specific opinions and um, in they can like your film but also uh, they can say that uh, the one that you think it's better, it's not. So um, it's in the end, we are human. And uh, there are those people who decide which film will enter the competition or which film will get some prizes. Um, they also do it on their specific personal opinions. So um, if you enter more festivals, then you are reaching more people who are behind it. and. Uh, Maybe some other works will get, uh, maybe your film won't get this year to be part of, I don't know, Four Rivers, but it will come to Glasgow or something like that. So um, for us, when we were kids and we, when we were young filmmakers, uh, for us, it was very important to try to apply more and more to, to as many festivals as we can. And I think that today when you have Film Freeway and everything, it's really 
easy. You make one application and you basically just click wherever you want to send it. So um, just uh, try to um, to reach out and uh, grab as many opportunities as you, as you can. So that would that would be something like that. <laughs> But the flip side to that is that it can be quite expensive because Film Freeway is obviously you can enter hundreds and hundreds of festivals, but this is going to cost you quite a lot of money. So um, that's why it's good to have a strategy to work out what film festivals are going to be best for you, I think. Otherwise, you'll be spending... Yeah. Um, okay, spending we don't money. have entry fees. So. Ah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. Um, but Phil, in, in your experience, what do you think is the what's the best way that filmmakers can actually engage like really get the most out of um being a part of an online festival selection and especially um, looking forward to lsff next week yeah i mean hopefully it's the same as what they'll get out of being in a physical festival that the fact that the festival's selected their work is um is something that that, that they can um you know sort of be proud of i mean in terms of we were talking a bit about you know um films getting selected and um, I mean the issue is with 5,000 submissions and we're only accepting around about 200 you know there's going to be many 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 films that I absolutely love that aren't going to be in the festival because there's literally no room mm -hmm. uh, obviously we're not it's not just me working on the selection there's a whole team I think there's about 15 if you add them all up on in terms of pre-selection international pre-selectors documentary selectors animation selectors so um you know, it's such a big sort of operation trying to watch this amount of films uh, and then sort of make the final selection. And that's, you know, takes up quite a lot of the year. But, you know, hopefully the films that are the ones that we do select that either go into the festival or go into the competition programs, uh, you know, in the same way that if they were in the physical festival, this would be something that will be good for the filmmaker, hopefully. Um, um, yeah, so, so, yeah. And, um, before we open up for um, questions from the audience, um, Katie, do you have any tips? Yeah, uh, I, um, I always say to people that you have to understand as a filmmaker what you are expecting from the festival circuit. Um, the main thing should be to get your work seen and then anything else that happens after that is a bonus. So if you are um, nothing um, amazing happens from suddenly turning up at a film festival and you know you don't suddenly just sell a feature film to Hollywood it's it's kind of like it's it's a stepping stone it's part of the process it's you showing your work as a creative that it has been strong enough to be selected by a festival it's engaging with an audience you're proving your worth you're proving your work stands on its own two feet so when we say to filmmakers Actually, the, the pandemic has provided an opportunity to filmmakers right now to be able to create and generate more content to show to somebody else in the industry that they are doing work, that they are kind of still creating and, and garnering as much kudos as they can in the situation we're in. So we always say the same thing, like you can get selected for a festival. That's the first step. And that's why the festivals you submit to should count. They should be of worth. They should be legitimate. They should be something that translates to someone else in the industry that goes, that's a really hard festival to get into. This, you know, I need to look at this filmmaker. I want to see the film. Or that's a particular niche festival. That means that that filmmaker has understood their audience. Mm -hmm. You know, all of those these kind of elements all kind of stack on top of each other. But at the end of the day, it is still down to the filmmaker to utilize that. It's the same as if you're a writer or if you're a director and you're looking for representation. Once you get an agent, it doesn't mean you suddenly get loads of work. What it means is that you have a stamp of approval and you can still go out and search for those opportunities. You just have a little bit more kind of bolstering up behind you because you've got those selections under your belt for your film or because you're represented by a certain person. So you should kind of see it as you know, a progression and whether it's your first time on the circuit or the, or the fourth time on the circuit, you're all building up. You're always trying to kind of achieve a little bit more, a little bit higher. So I think there's a lot of um, personal stress put on filmmakers, you know, from their own personal kind of, you know, situation, because they're always aspiring, but seeing everyone else around them do better. It's tough. The circuit is really hard. 
every festival is getting like thousands and thousands of submissions. And as everyone said here, it doesn't mean that your film wasn't selected because it was terrible, but because competition is fierce. It's always getting fierce. Festivals that used to get 200 submissions get 2000, um, you know, and the selection process will vary from festival to festival. So I think the one thing to kind of get out of an online situation right now is if a festival gives you the opportunity to be part of a panel or do an interview, or if they're doing regional press because they might be a small festival festival in the outback of Australia, but suddenly they're kind of getting coverage because they're a festival going ahead in a, you know, in a pandemic. Um, although Australia is doing pretty well compared to us. So maybe uh, if I say somewhere like France, um, you know, that the, there's still opportunities, more opportunities than usual. Um, so you kind of have to take the benefit of the doubt and just go, actually, this is a really good opportunity. The one thing I will say is if a festival offers you that opportunity, take it because i've seen so many uh, being someone who is offering moderation for panels for other festivals so many filmmakers don't turn up and they waste that opportunity to talk about their film mm. and that is something like if you have a q a or if you're on a panel or if they've done a you know a little package on you that's content for you to share on your own platforms or your own websites or your own filmmaker page whatever and that is stuff that you haven't had to create. All you've had to do is turn up because you were selected. It's kind of, it's a nice way of promoting yourself without it feeling a little bit sycophantic. So, you know, all those opportunities, it's somebody else doing the hard work for you. You just have to kind of, you know, turn up and, and kind of share. And that I think is a, is a good, good opportunity. Thank you so much, Katie. And um, I think there's this is a good time to open up for audience questions. And I'm gonna try to pick ones. There's been a lot submitted, so thank you for that. I'm gonna try to pick some very specific ones for some slightly larger, broader spectrum ones. So, and this is for anyone who might want to answer, so chip in. Um, so Jerry asks, a uh, very filmmaker specific question, what free platforms can you recommend for screening films that are privacy protected? Does anyone have any technical advice for Jerry? I I, I presume, does he mean to I'm share a yeah. screener with festivals? Yeah. Um, well, you're, you're kind of, I mean, from a submission side of things, you're kind of locked into what the festival accepts. Because, you know, if they're listed on a submission platform like Film Freeway or Short Film Depot, you have to upload the film onto that platform. Mm -hmm. Or with Film Freeway, you can embed uh, a Vimeo link. Um, but then there are some festivals that literally just want an email sent to them or they have an online form. Um, but sometimes they're very specific and say, we don't accept Vimeo or Dropbox links. Mm -hmm. So I kind of feel like you're... If it's, a if it's a question of how to host your film without it costing money, um, I'm not sure there is a free, a free one, I don't think, just off the back of it. Because I think even Vimeo, you have to pay for a membership. You might not necessarily need to get the pro unless you're uploading more than 20 gig a week. But yeah, I would say I don't think there is one. Um, I think that Vimeo is uh, free for if you don't use pro version mm -hmm. and I think that on YouTube you can have something some kind of um, password I'm, I'm not quite sure how but uh, I haven't tried it but I know that uh, sometimes when we got entries we had a um, couple of times the uh, the privacy settings that had to be moderated even on youtube so maybe they can yeah you, about, youtube it, you can have it as unlisted so it means it's yeah. not private that it wouldn't show up yeah mm -hmm. and then um m um no name here asks have you found that industry vip so commissioners funders execs still participate in your online festivals who wants to take that Phil, you're smiling, so you take it. <laughs> no, I'm not sure. I mean, because we haven't had the festival yet. I mean, it's a difficult question to answer because that's, I mean, that's interesting, actually, because, you know, even with LFF, you know, um, the festival's going ahead, but you're still just sitting in the flat on your own. And that feels quite sort of, um, you feel quite distant from the festival. And obviously we kick off next Friday. Um, 
so you know it's going to be no different to me sitting here you know in my flat you know with the festival going on so it's difficult yeah so at this stage i don't don't really know um i mean like we said earlier any film that was say in lff that um short film that has been in lff is obviously going to have some sort of industry engagement and the industry is going to know that those filmmakers were selected for for lff Mm -hmm. Uh, we kind of mentioned that earlier so um i'm not sure i mean taking things forward for next week you know we have an industry program with panels and um discussions planned so you know that's obviously still a part of the festival the way it would be in a physical space i can i can talk from a film like from having handling well from handling different filmmakers works with festivals across the territories um we know that industry professionals are still attending the festivals that we're we're actually dealing with because we are getting other festivals saying hey i saw your film at calgary international can you submit to our festival because we've got a children's section or an animation section Mm -hmm. and that's still going on we're also getting uh, filmmakers um, whose work screened at you know european festivals and international festivals maybe further afield are saying hey we have a vod platform or sales um, and we're interested in considering your film so i know from our perspective yes again dependent on the level of festival um but we know that a lot of the American festivals are attending each other's um, festivals as industry um, because a lot of programmers are wanting to go and source content from other festivals. So yes, um, I would say definitely. Cool. And that brings me neatly on to a question from, uh, from Patrick. And it's that do you have a sense of online festival audience demographics? Are audiences getting younger or more diverse or um, or perhaps both? Um, Senya, Yanya, Rebecca, maybe because you've had your festival editions, you could answer, you could take that one. Uh, as we mentioned uh, at one point uh, in in the cinema you can fit uh, in car watts for each screening uh, like maximum to 200 people and now you have an audience from for about i don't know in the end we had uh, 45,000 people who somehow were engaged in festival so definitely it's uh, the, the numbers are much bigger and the audience is much uh, much wider so yeah you have parents who can watch now i don't know grandma grandpa or who are who couldn't participate before but now they can so yeah for sure everything is getting bigger but as i mentioned it's it's quite uh, different to have it online and physical um yeah we're in a slightly same position as phil which was gyff in september was mostly physical and Glasgow Film Festival, which takes place on the 24th of February, um, is probably going to be our first um, experience of, of the change in demographics for our, our kind of general audience. Mm-hmm. And it'll be super interesting to see because, as I mentioned, at Glasgow Film, we, we kind of do a lot of outreach work around all of our festivals and activities. So we've been surveying um surveying those groups and kind of working with them to establish like how they might want to engage i think a key thing or consideration for me in particular is that in glasgow um and i'm sure it's similar in other places is there's quite a big digital gap um in t- terms of people having access to good quality um, viewing equipment access to broadband etc um and that's something that is difficult um to kind of quantify in any sense um, and it's very difficult from from our position to um, do anything about it um, in fact Glasgow interestingly was in the process of giving every school pupil child and primary schools an iPad before all this happened so some schools have all their pupils having iPads some schools don't um, so you could probably look at it on that level as well um, however, I think that's why it's very important 
as festival organizers to make sure that you're partnering with organizations that are better at doing that work than we are like we can't do everything um, we can't reach everybody but I think if you've got um, successful partnerships with unis colleges schools um, or community groups or filmmaker groups or whatever that's a really useful way I think of monitoring your audience and ensuring that you're reaching the people you, you want to reach um, I think that we can't forget with just putting a film online that yes you can do your online marketing but if you have a film that speaks to a particular community group you still have to do the work to engage with that particular community group um, and can't see online it being accessible online as a, as a replacement for that, I think. Thank you. And um, there's another question here from James, which is, do you give the filmmakers whose work is streamed in your festival the viewing data for their films? Or would you, I guess I could add. Oh, what, for how many people have watched the films? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Good question. Um, I don't know if they did that through the BFI um, for the LFF. It's something we haven't discussed here, but it's an interesting thing to take forward, yeah. Would you for LSFF? I mean, I'd have to talk to the team. <laughs> it's, not, it's not come up. <laughs> but it's an interesting idea, yeah. So it's something Have you seen, um, Katie, have you seen many festivals or any festivals share that sort of information with the filmmakers? Um, yes and no, um, but it, it's going to be um, dependent on what system they have set up. So, for example, if somebody's using something like CineSend, which is an online platform for festivals to receive uh, deliverables, um, which can be set up as a platform to be used, um, I think you can. I think you can. And I know in some circumstances, festivals have collated data. It might, n it might not necessarily be as specific for your film. So, for example, if your film is programmed in a block, it means that, you know, those 10 films are viewable as one piece of content. So you won't be able to kind of know exactly like, you know, how many people tuned in just for your film because they're watching the entire block. Mm -hmm. um, it's dependent on the actual platform that festivals using. Um, for example, uh, some festivals were using uh, Vimeo links, which the statistics for Vimeo, um, just a little tip, pay no heed to them because they don't necessarily reflect um, the exact kind of correct data. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you filter Vimeo through a third party like Film Freeway or somewhere else, those statistics don't always kind of match because it's through a third party. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it will vary. We have had some statistics, but it's generally been in, in a kind of en masse general. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I think, yeah, it, it will vary. But I, I think out of the festivals that we have had data from, I mean, it's kind of, you know, what do you want the data for? Um, mm -hmm. Because if it's to kind of promote it to somebody, um, being so hyper specific might not necessarily pay off whereas it should be more about the prestige of the festival and the event that's what i would say i suppose it could be useful for um knowing whether you should enter the, that festival again next year because if you get your data and you've only got a very small amount of people watching it might be yeah. or maybe i'll just pass on that festival because they're not getting big audiences mm -hmm. Fair point, very fair point. And um, I'm very conscious of time and that we're, we're going to have to start wrapping up. So we've got time for one last question, which I think is a really important one from Joshua. And it's what changes that you made in 2020 will you take forward for future events? I mean, I think this is what's um, on everyone's, everyone's talking about at the moment, because obviously we've made this big move to an online space. So there's no reason why the festival shouldn't exist like this every year. Um, obviously, we will get back to physical screenings and fingers crossed, you know, um, in the next couple of years, things are going to be start getting back to audiences, gathering, going to cinemas, doing networking in the bar, all that kind of thing. But I can't see why we would even think about stopping the online platform now that we've learned so much about how to put that together and how to to, to get that out there it makes total sense to to keep it going um yeah. beyond into 2022 and onwards 
I think it's uh, it's quite exciting in that sense that, that this has happened. It's um, made a lot of people have to do changes very quickly, but these were changes that were kind of being talked about a lot over the last few years. I'm sure, you know, people are aware that there's been lots of discussion about, you know, online, 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 as Katie mentioned earlier. So the fact that this has happened means that those discussions have now had to be speeded up and now we can go forward and hopefully continue to, to work in this way. Thank you. Um, I actually really agree with Phil, which is a lot of the things that we're currently doing are things that previously had maybe been pipe dreams or things that were like, oh, one day we'll do this with Instagram or one day we'll do this with our Twitter or blog or website. And I think there's an extent to which, um, you know, we're kind of taking a bit of a digital leap forward in, in having this as an opportunity to expand. Um, I think for me, um, there was something maybe quite ethereal about what we did in the past. We would run these big, massive, amazing events, and they'd be brilliant, and then everyone would go home, and we would maybe have some photographs and maybe some uh, survey statements. Whereas now I think there is a lot more kind of um, emphasis on kind of recording these events, capturing them, making sure that they're available after the date that happened you know like often if we have an incredible guest coming along if you haven't made that screening you'll never see what that filmmaker shared or, or what advice that they gave whereas now we'll be much more efficient at capturing that both on and offline and I think that will be an incredible um, thing to do. Um, to be honest I can't wait till we have a world in which we can run physical events again and I think that um, you know, the cinema is such an incredibly safe space for so many people and um, in Glasgow, it's, you know, it's a real kind of community um, that we have around GFT. However, I think what it's shown us is that there's multiple ways in which we can engage with that community and that we should endeavour to keep up these methods. Um, just in everything that I'm doing right now, everything that I ask myself is, does this have a future beyond COVID? Like, am I designing this workshop or this activity or this event purely as a response to COVID? Or does it have some kind of longevity beyond what we're doing? Can it be pivoted back into being physical? Or is it a resource that I'll keep, that the team will keep after um, this? And I think that's an important question to ask ourselves because we still have to provide quality um, and we still have to make sure that the things that we're doing have thought and integrity behind them. So I think if you find yourself kind of jumping to do something to fill a space, sometimes it's just useful to take a wee step back and think like, why are you doing that? And what is the usefulness about it? And that's something that I can just keep coming back to and I find really useful throughout this process. But um, Hopefully when GYFF comes back next year, there will be physical um, capacity, but also for all of you lovely people that can't make it to Glasgow, we'll have online and recordings of events and live streamings that people can get involved in as well. Thank you. Um, Senya, Senya, would you like to add anything? Well, um, just uh, what we mentioned uh, through, through the whole panel is that um, you can't uh, you can't uh, change the feeling when you are watching a film and you with all other people in in the audience and uh, you laugh together to to certain points and. Um, I think that this is something what um, cannot be changed, but um, but for sure, uh, COVID, except from from anything what's really bad, it it has brought us uh, the switch in uh, in our minds uh, to to be able to switch to online mode, which isn't so so uh, physical but uh, to bring us um, to, to so many people and to connect us to people who might not ever been to our festival or to, to some other ones. Uh, so it, it has learned us uh, so many things and uh, it has uh, set us to, to reset the entire world. So I think that um, 
for us at Four Rivers, uh, for sure, we, we will continue with the online, but we are hoping to, to have the physical as soon as possible. Xenia? <laughs> Sorry, I got the... Uh... Yeah, uh, if you're uh, watching online uh, film festivals, try to watch it with someone at home as well. Uh, immediately you get another feeling, either that's your mother, brother, whoever, two or three friends who are epidemic, epidemically uh, fine. So, and yeah, um, I speak with everyone and uh, hopefully will be in person next year i mean this year <laughs> yeah and um but definitely we'll uh, keep some of the program online so follow it uh, try to try to watch when the film, uh, festivals are taking place and uh, there's one festival each day i would say <laughs> even more so just keep track of that Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I'm very conscious that we're running out of time. Um, so before I hand back over to Alex to finalize the event, can you just tell everyone who's attending and who's watching right now where they can find your work, your festival online, and if there's any opportunities for people to get involved? Um, let's start with how I'm seeing you in my gallery. So let's start with you, Katie. Um, so first of all, Formula is a consultancy company. We help filmmakers navigate the worldwide circuit. So um, we have, uh, we're on all the socials. I do recommend you follow us um, because we basically announce any new film that we take on our slate. So you can see the quality that we're kind of taking on, but we also announce every single selection that our clients get, which is a really nice way of finding out about festivals that maybe you do know about, but also festivals that you don't know about. Um, we consider everything for free. All we ask is that the film is 2020 onwards. Um, and if you go to our website, festivalformula.com, you'll be able to see at the very bottom about sending a link to the film. Um, but yeah, that's, we're here to help. Uh, so there you go. Thank you. And Phil? Um, yeah, well, the festival kicks off next Friday. Um, shortfilms.org.uk or on, on the various socials is... Uh, all the information. Um, we have about 30 programs of shorts uh, selected from open submission, as I said, about 200 or so films. Um, and we have an industry program as well, uh, some of which will be, uh, in fact, most of which will be live streamed. Um, we've got slightly less kind of retrospective special events this year because of the thing about the London Short Film Festival is we were doing a lot of crossover with live music and um, live events and I think that's something we did sort of pull back on this year and technically that wasn't something we could handle on top of trying to deliver a, a festival as well um, but yeah check the website shortfilms.org.uk and uh, see what we've got what um, things are happening thank you and Rebecca um, yeah, glasgowfilm.org for all updates for events. We have Glasgow Film Festival um, starting on 24th of February to 7th of March using our online platform, Glasgow Film at Home. Um, and we have a full industry um, event with that as well, so check out. Um, and all the details you can find there for Glasgow Youth Film Festival, our submissions um, will hopefully open maybe in like May, June. So just stay tuned for that. Um, we, those are for filmmakers under 30 um, for those ones. Excellent. And Anya? Well, um, our festival is for authors who are 14 to 20 years old and uh, know already uh, just popped our uh, web in the chat, so you can uh, check it there. It's uh, .hr, and there you can see us on Facebook and Instagram and you can check how the festival uh, was held this year, so you, you can see short videos just to to get the atmosphere and um, the years before when we had audience <laughs> so hype. Uh, so uh, feel free to apply your films until uh, June the 1st. We don't have any other, um, we don't have any, any entry fees, so it's for free and we are expecting your films. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, please uh, check also the archive on the web page because uh, we have all our 
film catalogs uh, uh, in PDF. Um, I mean, uh, some of useful videos and things like that. So browse to the websites and you'll find lots of uh, useful material. I'd also like to add that we will be open for submissions in probably late January, early February for the 2022 festival. We open pretty much straight away. So any filmmakers <laughs> that have got work ready to go, then do check the short films website for the uh, submissions opening. Great. Thank you so much to all of you for um, for your contributions and for your generosity in sharing um, information, data, and your experience so far in adapting to um, a pretty intensely crazy situation. So thank you all of you, and um, for those of you who are gearing up for the next set of future editions of your festivals, good luck. And um, I'm going to hand over to Alex now to wrap up this event. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you to all the panelists. It was really, really insightful discussion. Um, thank you everyone in the audience for your questions. So we received 135 um, questions today. So apologies to everyone whose question didn't get answered. We tried to get through as many as we could in the 15 minute slot that we had. Um, and I know you're all waiting for me to announce the uh, winner of our Zoom um, competition. Uh, but just before that, I wanted to say a couple of things. One is that um, as always, you'll be receiving an email from Eventbrite after this um, event uh, with a short link to um, a um, survey. Uh, it would be really helpful for us if you could take a couple of minutes just to tell us what you thought of today's session, what you liked, what you think we could improve, um, and um, so on. I think Noel has just posted a survey link in the chat box as well if you prefer um, to just um, copy and paste it from there. Um, I also wanted to let you know about um, um, future film festivals. So we um, at Film Academy will We'll be pausing our online labs activity until April um, so that we can focus our attention to uh, Future Film Festival and also Flair Festival in March. Um, so Future Film Festival, as I said at the beginning, will take place between the 18th and the 21st of February. Uh, it will be a virtual festival uh, and it, it's four days of um, really insightful discussions like um, today's discussion, masterclasses, workshops, and also a screening. So our film program will launch on the 29th of January. So keep um, checking our um, social media channels and also um, sign up for the Film Academy newsletter uh, to be the first to find out when uh, the program is live, um, what some of the events in the program um, are. Um, and now um, for the winner of the Lacey uh, competition, thank you for all your questions um, again. Um, if you hear me call out your name, please can you type here um, in the chat box, be um, ready to do that. I'll give you uh, a few seconds to um, respond um, and if you don't, I'll move on to calling um, the next name. So, um, the winner of the Lacey rugged two terabyte hard drive is Patrick Hopkins. Patrick, are you still around? We'll give Patrick a few seconds um, to say if he's around. No, okay. Patrick, Patrick Hopkins, last call. Are you around? Patrick is here, amazing. Congratulations, Patrick. Um, I will be in touch next week about mailing your um, hard drive. Um, well done on your question. Um, and thank you everyone for attending today's session. Um, for those of you who've been selected for the one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions with Katie from Festival Formula, then we'll speak to you this afternoon. For everyone else, hopefully see you at Future Film Festival. Have a lovely weekend.